السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ تعالیٰ وبرکاتہ ان اللہ و ملائکۃ یسلون عالنبی یا یادین عامن صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم و تسلیمہ اللہ صلی اعلیٰ سیدنا مولانا محمد وعلیٰ علی سیدنا مولانا محمد و صحابی وبارک وسلم صلاحت و السلام علیہ کے سید یا صنعت یا حبیبی یا طبیبی یا رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم و علیہ علی کا و صحابی کا یا رحمۃ العالمین اوت عدم بمن بے سر و ساما مدد قبلہ دی مدد کعبہ امام مدد قدری یم نارائے اوت عدم ضنم تمز شیخ احمد رضا خاں قطب عالم ضنم سیدی یا مرشدی شاہ مصطفیٰ خاں زند آباد ہاں ملے فیض رضا مصطفیٰ امداد کن صلی اللہ علیہ نبی المی و علی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم صلاۃ وسلم علیہ کے سید یا حبیبی یا رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم و علیہ کا وصحاب کے اور رحمت العالمین اور فریز ڈیوٹ آن مائی اللہ درود ان سلام سپون دا موسٹ پرفیکٹ ایکزول ٹو دین گلوری فائر آف اللہ کریشن سو یو مولانا محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم پیس بلیسنگز اینڈ سیلیوٹیشنز اپن انبیاء کرام محلب تتھار صحاب کرام خلفاء راشدین تبعین تبع تابعین ائمہ مشتہدین اولیاء کاملین انٹل دا لاسٹ ڈے وی تھینک اللہ سبحانہ و تعالی تو انفنٹ مرسی اینڈ فور دا بلیسنگ اف دا بلوود نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم فور بلیسنگ اس تو دا اپرچونٹی اینڈ گیونگ اس دا توفیق خیر ٹو ریممبر ہم اینڈ ہز بلوود رسول صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم الحمدللہ ٹو ڈے از دا 25th اف رمضان اینڈ سیشن نمبر 24 اف دس رمضان سیریز wherein we are attempting to learn piety from the lives of the pious. Alhamdulillah, we learned many great lessons from yesterday's session while taking a glimpse at a narration from the life of Sahabi Rasul, Hadrat Sayyidina Khubab bin Adi radiallahu an, and uh, his piety and firmness and patience and perseverance, and how this granted him such an exalted status, and how the actions and the character of the pious turn the hearts of people towards Islam. We learned, there were many, many lessons in, in yesterday's session, uh, and I'm sure we have all taken heed to it. <clears throat> the pious servants of Almighty Allah are indeed amazing and beautiful examples for us to follow. Uh, I am once again reiterating that, I have, what I, that which I have been saying throughout these sessions. In other words, keep yourself attached to the pious servants of Almighty Allah, because this attachment will be a means of salvation for us in the dunya and in the akhirat. Before we go further, one more time through the park. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina Mawlana Muhammad wa ala Ali Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa ashabihi wa barik wa sallim sallu alayhi. Today we will take a glimpse into the life of a very blessed personality and a sahabi, a rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well, who is also the cousin of the beloved rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In other words, today we will try to learn piety from Hadrat Sayyiduna Jafar bin Abi Talib radiyallahu an, also well known as Hadrat Jafar Tayyar radiyallahu an. He was a notable personality, notable negotiator, masterful orator. Uh, but still, he was humble and lived a very simple life. From his life today, we will attempt to learn lessons like courage, steadfastness, propagating righteousness and his kindness. Because the idea of these sessions is to learn piety from the pious. And these are all parts of, uh, the branches of piety that we learn from the lives of the pious servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding Hadrat Sayyidina Jafar ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, it is mentioned he would often bring home people who had no food, no place to live. And he would uh, gladly uh, share a meal with them. This is again a very important lesson which we learn from the lives of the pious. They never treated the poor and the needy with disrespect. And they never did anything which harmed the dignity of the needy and the downtrodden. But they always made them feel comfortable and welcome and took care of their honor. And this is the manner of the pious, and this is something that we should all adopt. Uh, <clears throat> it was also from amongst the characteristics of the pious servants of Almighty Allah to remain simple and humble. But when it came to speaking out for the sake of deen, they never shied away. They never showed any fear or favor. And even in the court of, uh, of kings, they said what needed to be said. The history of Islam bears testimony to this. The history of Islam bears testimony to this, that in every era, be it in the presence of generous kings or in the presence of dictators. The pious servants of Almighty Allah spoke about the greatness and the honor of Islam and they praised Almighty Allah and His beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in every such condition. In every such condition, beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even under the most difficult circumstances, they did so. And subhanAllah, one such example which can be found in the beautiful pages of Islamic history 
is from the life of Hadrat Sayyidina Jafar bin Abi Talib, or as I said, known, well known as Sayyidina Jafar al Tayyar radiallahu ta'ala an. Now it is well known, we've done this when we were in Madrasa, when we were kids, we learned about this as well. Uh, and I'm sure we've been reading and listening about uh, the history of Islam. Uh, and we should, we should learn about the history of our, our, our deen and it's very, very important. And one beautiful way of doing this is to read the seerah, the life of the beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we will learn a lot about the history of Islam. So it is well known, we all know well, that the first hijrat, the first migration, which the Muslims made to be safe from the merciless persecution of the kuffar in Makkah, was to Habsha. It was to Habsha. The first hijrat was to Habsha. In other words, Abyssinia, which is today known as Ethiopia. It's today known as Ethiopia. Hence, Africa has a very blessed place in the history of Islam. And it was in Africa that the early Muslims were given refuge against the kuffar in Makkah. And I think uh, this is one of the reasons that Africa has been blessed with such a large Muslim population. And many of its countries and cities are home to the Mazarat of many great awliya ikram, including our country, South Africa, where we have great awliya ikram also present here. And <clears throat> at the same time, the, the nazr ikram of the other great scholars and the awliya of every zamana have been on Africa. And I think the reason for this is because of this, this migration to Africa by the companions of the beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa and because of the refuge that Africa had given to the Muslims at that time. Uh, even if you look at Ala Hadrat Adimul Barkat radiallahu ta'ala an, if you look at uh, Ala Hadrat Adimul Barkat radiallahu ta'ala an, you will also see that uh, Ala Hadrat radiallahu ta'ala an uh, would be sent many questions from Africa. And Ala Hadrat Azimul Barkat radiallahu an even wrote the famous Fatawa Africa. So again, the Nazare Karam towards Africa because of this very important. Uh, part of Islamic history. Africa is a very, very, very huge part of Islam, of, of, of Muslims and Islamic history. And I think sometimes we forget that. And it is something that uh, I am, I, I, I'm trying to remind myself and you about right now. Now, <clears throat> regarding Hadrat Sayyidina uh, Jafar Tayyar and how brave he was and how courageous he was, there is a narration about the, about the Hijrat, about the migration to Abyssinia. Now, there are many uh, narrations, there are many rewites regarding this. Some are brief, some are lengthy. I'm going to give you a brief narration, which is the synopsis of, of many of the, 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 the lengthy narrations because of time constraints. And I'm also going to then, after that, try and uh, explain a few more points that are from other narrations briefly so that we kind of understand this properly. Now, Hazrat Sayyidina, in this narration particularly, Hazrat Sayyidina Buraida radiallahu reports from his father that Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his father says that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded us to go with Hazrat Jafar ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an towards Habsha. In other words, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded them to migrate to Abyssinia. Okay, and we know today Abyssinia is known as Ethiopia, as I just said. So Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded uh, us, he said, to go to Habsha, to Ethiopia, to Abyssinia with Hadrat Jafar ibn Abi Talib radiallahu And he says that in this narration that uh, Habsha was the kingdom of the king Najashi, who in the, in the west is known as Negus or Negus, okay? So it went, uh, they were commanded by Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to go to, 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 to Habsha, to, to Ethiopia, to Abyssinia, uh, which was the kingdom of Najashi at that time. When the Kufar in Makkah heard about this, that the Muslims have gone towards uh, Abyssinia, they have gone to, to, to Habsha, they sent Amr bin As and Umar bin Walid to Habsha as well with many gifts and valuables so that they may present it in the court of the king because they were very wealthy, okay? Uh, and the narrator says that when we reached the court of Najashi, we found that these two were already present in his royal court and had already presented all the valuable gifts which he had accepted from them. The two of them then made sajda, they prostrated before him, who Amr bin As and Umar, they, they made sajda to, 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 to Najashi, the king of Abyssinia. And they said, oh king, there are some people from, your country, from our country who have left their deen, they have left their religion, and presently they are seeking refuge and taking refuge in your country. So Najashi asked, in my country? So he said, yes, in your country. Now, further explaining this, the narrator of this hadith gives a better, uh, more detailed explanation. He says that the king of Habsha summoned us to come before him. Hadrat Jafar said to his companions, he said to them at that time, that none of you must say anything today, 
Leave it to me. I will speak to Najashi. Let me talk to Najashi. So the narrator says that when we reached the court of Najashi, the royal court was in session. Subhanallah, I want you to listen very carefully. He says that the royal court was in session. We found Amr bin As sitting on the right of Najashi and we saw Umar bin Walid sitting on the left of Najashi. Okay. Now can you imagine the situation, you walk into the court of a king, you are in his country, you have left your country because of persecution, you walked into a court of a king who you need to take, uh, who you expect that will give you refuge and sanctity in his country, and now on his right and his left are sitting your enemies, with him, beside his throne. Can you imagine what, what is the condition of a person at that time? But subhanallah, this was the courage of the Sahaba Ikram. This is how the pious people are, okay? And look at what happens, Allah Akbar. They say we found Amr bin As sitting on his right and Amara bin Walid, Ibn Walid sitting on his left. Whereas all his other ministers and priests were standing and the monks were standing in front of him in lines with complete respect and with their hands folded. They were standing in front of Najashi. Amr bin As and Ibn Walid had already informed, they say, had informed the king. The narrator says that they had already informed the king that when these people come after you summon them, they will refuse to make sajda to you. They will refuse to prostrate in front of you. So as soon as we entered, the narrator says, as soon as we came in front of the king, his priests and his monks and his ministers asked us to make sajda to him. Now can you imagine visualizing the situation in your mind that what a difficult moment this is. They have come there for refuge. They enter and they see both the enemies, the delegates of their enemies, their biggest enemies, sitting beside the king. And now as they enter, they are being told, make sajda to him, prostrate to him. Today, people compromise deen like it's like nothing. Learn from these companions of the beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We must learn, and I said this yesterday, we must learn from them. Do not compromise the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. If you need to act, act within the deen. But do not compromise the deen because of kuffar, because of world powers, because of anything else. Because then we're going to be transgressors and answerable and held in contempt and we have to be and we will answer in the court of Allah. Okay? Al Bir la Yabla wa Dhamla Yunsa wa Dayan la Yamut Imal Ma Shaita Kamata Dinu Tudan. Remember this here. That your good deeds are never forgotten. They won't be perished. And your 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 wrongs and your sins are never forgotten. And the one who recompenses and rewards. What dayan la yamut, he can never die. He is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'mal ma shaytaka ma tadinu tuda. Do what you want. You will reap whatever you sow. Think about this here. Going back to the narration. Through the pak Allah masalli ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyana, Mawlana Muhammad wa ala Ali Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa Ashabi wa Barik wa Salim. So the moment they enter, what happens? They are being told by the ministers and the priests and the monks at the court of Najashi that makes sajda. Now what would somebody do there in a case like that? Because it's a very difficult situation. It's an, it's an extreme situation. You've come there for refuge. You've been called. Your enemies are sitting right in front. And now you are being told to make sajda. Hadrat Jafar al-Tayyar radiallahu ta'ala an. The ashik rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The a leader amongst the pious. What does he say? He, said to, to, he says to uh, Najashi, to the king of Abyssinia, he says, we do not make sajda to any but almighty Allah. Allah Akbar, subhanallah, subhanallah, may we be sacrificed upon the love of these companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and upon their bravery and their courage and, and, and their non, non-compromising character for the sake of Islam. We do not make sajda, Hazrat Jafar al-Tayyar says, we do not make sajda to anyone but Almighty Allah. Najashi, when he heard this, the king heard this, he asked the reason for this. So Hazrat Jafar al-Tayyar radiallahu said, Almighty Allah has sent us, sent amongst us a Rasul whose coming was foretold and glad tidings of his arrival were mentioned by Hadrat Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, wherein he alayhi salatu wasalam said, a prophet will come, a rasul, a nabi will come after me and his name will be Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wasalam. So O Najashi, it is that rasul sallallahu alayhi wasalam who has commanded us to only worship one Allah and not to associate any partner to him, not to, not to ascribe any partner to him. And it is he sallallahu alayhi wa who commanded us to perform salah and to give zakat. He has commanded us to, go, to do good and virtuous deeds and to abstain from sin. Najashi was very impressed with what Hadrat Jafar al-Tayyar had said. He was very impressed. And 
because he was speaking haq, Hazrat Jafar al-Tayyar refused to make sajda. And, but he said, when the reason was asked, look what a beautiful reason he gave. He gave the dalil of the rub of Isa al-Islam, being the rub of Allah, of, of, of uh, being the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being the rub of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah. So Najashi was very impressed with what Hazrat Sayyidina Jafar al-Tayyar said. And when Amr bin As saw that what was happening, he immediately said, O oh king, Allah keep you well. May Almighty keep you well. The belief of these people is contrary to yours on the matter of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. They don't believe the same as you believe in Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. So Najashi then to say to Hazrat Jafar at Ya radiallahu what does your Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa say about Hazrat Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam? Hazrat Sayyidina Jafar bin Abi Talib radiallahu beautifully said, subhanallah, he said the aqidah and the belief of our Nabi regarding Nabi Isa alayhi salam is the same which Almighty Allah has commanded. In other words, he is Ruhullah and Kalimatullah. Almighty Allah created him from the Virgin Maryam radiallahu anha, who was never touched by man and who did not even realize she was carrying a child. On hearing this, it is reported, those, the narrator says on hearing this, Najashi picked up a stick which was lying on the ground and he raised it and said, O oh priests, O oh monks, he's saying the same thing which you people say. In other words, Hadrat Maryam radiallahu anha did not commit any wrong. He then said, Welcome, O oh Muslims, to you and to the Nabi who has come to you. I bear witness that he is indeed Allah's Rasul. And he is the one regarding whom Hadrat Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam has given glad tidings. He said, if I were not a king and I did not have these responsibilities, I would have personally traveled towards him sallallahu alayhi wasalam and presented myself before him sallallahu alayhi wasalam and I would have kissed his sacred nalain sharifain. Subhanallah, the sacred footwear of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasalam. And he said, O oh Muslims, live in my kingdom for as long as you wish. Subhanallah, subhanallah. Look at what the bravery and the courage, the result of the bravery and the courage and the non-compromise of Hazrat Jafar Tayyar radiallahu anh. Look at, look at, look at the, the, the iman, the light of iman inside them, what it caused and what a revolution it is causing in Najashi's heart. The narrator says that after saying this, Najashi commanded his servants to prepare appropriate meals for us and to arrange suitable clothes for us. And he ordered the gifts which Amr bin As and Mara bin Walid had brought to be returned to them. He refused to accept that and he said that I do not accept bribes. Subhanallah. Now this hadith, subhanallah, this narration, to tell you so that we understand more about how these pious people were, how the Sahaba Ikram were, and then we learn more from their lives. I'm going to take a little bit extra time of yours today, a few minutes more maybe. And I want to give you some points from the wider narrations that are there. In the narration of Hazrat Sayyidatuna Umm Salma radiallahu ta'ala an, the details of the speech which Hazrat Sayyidina, Abu Talib, uh, Sayyidina Jafar bin Abu Talib uh, radiallahu an gave are present. But due to time constraints, as these are very short sessions, I have presented the above narration which is more the gist of the happenings at the court of Najashi. However, some of the points which Hazrat Sayyidina Jafar, Jafar uh, Tayyar radiallahu an mentioned in the speech, uh, I want to tell you what he said, some of those points. And I'm, I'm sure they will strengthen our iman and teach us from, from the lives of these beloveds of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. Durud Pak one time more. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa ashabihi wa barik wa sallim sallu alayhi. He said, O king, he said to Najashi, O king, we were, we were ignorant. We worshipped idols. We ate the carrion and we did obscene things. We were notorious for severing family ties and, and breaking our promises. The powerful usurped the rights of the weak. We were drowning in these corrupt ways when Almighty Allah sent within us a Rasul. We know well and recognize the Nabis and the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi noble character. We know his Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's honesty and we know his trustworthiness and his Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's pure nature. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam invited us towards the oneness of Almighty Allah and towards worshipping only one Allah and to forsake the worshipping of rocks and stones and idols which we and our forefathers used to worship. He also commanded us to be truthful, to properly discharge the trust which has been entrusted to us, to be kind towards our relatives, to treat our neighbors well. He forbade us from forbidden acts and from killing one another. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded us to abstain from telling lies and from being immodest and obscene and from usurping the property of the orphans. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade us from falsely accusing those who are pure and chaste. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Chased, uh, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, commanded us to worship only Almighty Allah and not to, any, to, ex, to ascribe any partner to him. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam further commanded us to perform salah. 
He sallallahu command us to perform salah, to give zakah, to keep fast. Now, subhanallah, just listening to these words, you know, translating the, giving you the, the gist and the translation of the words which Hazrat Jafar Jafar Tayyar radiallahu an mentioned, uh, is, is, it will, it makes, causes, I don't know about you, but it causes, uh, an immense passionate feeling in the heart and, and, and the love for the Sahaba Ikram to say, subhanallah, subhanallah, how beautiful were these personalities. So in this eloquent manner, Hadrat Sayyidina Jafar radiallahu ta'ala an mentioned many of the teachings of Deen Islam which they learned from Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is why we are learning from them. After mentioning all the details, he said, so he said to the king, he said, so when the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us all this, we affirmed and we brought iman in him as Allah's Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we obeyed these commands, the commands which he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought from Almighty Allah. And we began to only worship one Allah without ascribing any partner to him. And he said, whatever he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has made haram upon us, we have regarded as haram. And whatever he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has made halal upon us, we have regarded as halal. Due to this, our people became our enemies. They troubled us immensely and placed us and placed before us such challenges due to our deen, which, which, which has left us troubled. So that, and they did this so that we leave worshipping Allah. And go back to worshipping idols. And so that we should uh, again regard all the evils and obscenities as lawful. When they went to such great extent to persecute us and severely oppressed us. And they constricted our paths to such an extent. That they became obstacles between us and our deen. It was only then that we left towards your country. O king, we left other countries and we chose your country. We left, we ignored other countries. And we chose your country, subhanallah, look at what he's saying, and we preferred you as a neighbor, so we came towards your country, and it is also narrated in, in one of the narrations, uh, regarding this, 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 in, this, this, this uh, discussion of uh, uh, Sayyidina Jafar Tayyar in the court of uh, Najashi, it is also narrated that during the session, Najashi asked if they, when you heard all of these things, he asked, did they have, he asked them if they had anything with them from the message which Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought, in other words from the Qur'an Azim. So Hadrat Sayyidina Jafar, the Ya Radiallahu Anh, answered in the positive and he then asked him to recite something from it. So Hadrat Sayyidina Jafar Radiallahu Anh recited the opening verses of Surah Maryam. And as he recited, Najashi began to weep as he heard and he listened to the ayats of Surah Maryam. It is mentioned that he wept so much that his beard was dripping with tears and his priests and ministers too wept on listening to the verses of the Holy Quran. I must say here that Najashi, the king of Abyssinia, something that I'm sure you know and I'm reminding you, that the king of Abyssinia, Najashi, on the invitation of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa accepted Islam. And his good fortune is that when he passed away in Habsha, in Abyssinia, the beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed his janazah salah in the holy city and this was unique for him at that time. Subhanallah, this was a blessing for him from the court of Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So in today's session, subhanallah, there's so many things we could learn from looking at, at what Islam teaches and what Hazrat Jafar, Jafar Tayyar radiallahu mentioned. And uh, I have summarized the details in this narration, presenting mostly the gist of it. But subhanallah, look at the beauty and the manner of Hazrat Sayyidina Jafar. Look at how he, in the presence of a king and in the presence of the representatives of the kuffar in Makkah, he did not show any fear, even though when arriving, he found them sitting in the positions of honor beside the king. He said what was haq and he passed the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He explained their condition before Islam and he explained their condition after Islam. He so beautifully explained how the beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam removed them from ignorance and brought them towards piety and goodness. And we have also observed, observed here in this, in this, in this subhanallah, in this narration, how the recitation of the Quran had an impact on the heart of Hadrat Najashi, radiallahu ta'ala, Hazrat Asma'a, his, his name was Asma'a, or some say Asama, uh, radiallahu ta'ala, an. And one thing that would be veiled in this, that, that may be veiled in this narration, and I'm gonna end with this, subhanallah, while I was reading this narration, uh, today, this, this thought came into my heart, and, and I want to share this with you that one thing that may be veiled in all the narrations relating to the migration of the Muslims to Abyssinia, I would like to point out here by the grace of Almighty Allah and the blessings of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that it may be veiled, it may not be very openly mentioned or it may, it, 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 it's not uh, very explicit 
in, in, in the narrations. But I think this veil is something that will be removed if we look at the life or the love of Rasulullah Sallallahu and the love of the pious. What I want to explain is, look, Hadrat Jafar Tayyar was indeed, Jafar Tayyar was indeed fearless and bold and showed steadfastness. But he was also completely confident, if you notice. Firstly, why was he so confident? Firstly, it was because the Iman was embedded in their hearts and souls. The Iman was embedded in their heart and souls. Whatever their tongue said is what was in their heart. It was what, is, what was in their roh as well. But there was another reason for this confidence. I feel there was another reason for this confidence. And what was that reason for this confidence? And this is a thought that came into my heart while reading this narration. Subhanallah. The reason was that because they were so confident, he was so confident, because they were sent to Abyssinia by none other than the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His confidence was because they were sent by Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Sayyidina Jafar the Yar knew that when Nabi sent us to Najashi, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew by his ilm ghayb and by the light of his nubuwa that this was the best place to seek refuge. In fact, my heart says that indeed the Sahaba were sent there for refuge and for migration. But it seems as if more than that, the actual reason for Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sending the Sahaba to Abyssinia was because Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam indeed knew that there was a king in whose nasib was Iman. The beloved Nabi knew that there was a king in whose nasib there was Iman and to afford him this blessing, Huzur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent the Sahaba Ikram to Abyssinia and Huzur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew, indeed Huzur knew and Huzur knew and knows that the deen of Islam will take deep roots in Africa and the blessings of this migration subhanallah can be seen today throughout the length and breadth of the African continent. Let us think about all these things and let us learn from the beloveds of Allah and the pious of Allah so that we can Apply in our lives their manner and their ways. Let us continue learning piety from the lives of the pious. I've taken a little bit more of your time today. And let us attach ourselves to them even more so that our attachment to the beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi becomes stronger. Very quickly, the simple rule that I'm giving every day. Question, is fasting conditional for Sadaqah Fitr to become wajib? In other words, everybody has to pay Sadaqah Fitr. But do I have to be fasting to give Sadaqah Fitr? What if I didn't fast? In the month of Ramadan, for whatever reason. So the answer to this is for Sadqa Fitr to become wajib, fasting is not conditional. If one did not fast due to some valid reason or due to traveling or due to an illness or old age, Allah forbid he left out the fast without a valid reason. Then in all the sad cases, the Sadaqa the sadqa Fitr is still compulsory, it is still wajib upon him, you still have to give the Sadaqa Fitr. Allah keep us with Iman, let us leave this world with Iman. Wa ma alayna il